Okay, welcome back. So let's just continue from where we stopped. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, the women were covering their head for um, modesty purposes. Uh, they were covering their head to show that they were married, that they were under the authority of their husband. Um, and uh, they were also, uh, another reason was that uh, in Roman, so we see a lot, and this is specific to the Corinthian context, OK? So this teaching is in the book of Corinthians, so specific to what the church in Corinth was dealing with. And one of the things that the church in Corinth was dealing with was a clash of uh, people from different classes of society. So there were some who were richer, some who were poorer. And so Roman upper class women usually would have very fancy hairstyles. And so they wanted to not cover their heads to show off their hairstyles. So this was also a clash of those classes in the church itself. Uh, so we see in the book of Corinthians a lot of this clash being addressed in different ways where people were being discriminated against based on their status in society. And here, because these women from, were from an upper class and could afford those kinds of things, uh, they it was not part of their culture to cover their head. So they would come in without a head covering. So that would be offensive to um, others uh, who believed that you need to cover your head to show modesty. Uh, so this is bring the church to the same to a place of caring for one another's culture, caring to not offend one another. Uh, and this is something, so we, in this case, can understand that principle and take it uh, for us to follow, right? When we gather as a church, there are people who come from such different cultural backgrounds. And we should be sensitive to what is offensive to somebody else just out of love and concern for our brothers and sisters. OK? So uh, we see in Corinthians, uh, Paul talking about giving up your rights for the sake of others. Uh, so just because I have a right to do something doesn't mean I do it. Um, and I don't care about how somebody else is affected by it. Uh, instead, I'm willing to give up my rights uh, so that somebody else will be protected, uh, so that somebody else will not fall as a result of my following what I believe is correct or wrong. Okay, So uh, taking that into consideration. So when we look at this example of women covering their heads, we understand what was the Corinthian church experiencing, what was the cultural background, why is Paul asking them to cover their heads, how can we take this and apply it in our context? If modesty is not shown by covering my head, but is shown in another way, then how can I show modesty in the church? How can I keep from offending others in the church through the things I'm uh, wearing, through the things I'm doing? Um, so those are the principles that we'll take from the passage and we'll apply it. So if we say, Oh, Paul said we all have to, all the women have to cover their heads. So we also have to cover our heads. We've missed the whole point of why he even talked about it, right? So we've missed that principle or the truth that's underlying that teaching. And we're just following a practice with no meaning. OK, so this is why understanding the culture and the context is so important. Likewise, in the same passage, it says that men should never cover their heads. Okay, so that men, if men cover their heads, then it's an insult. Uh, so again, that was particular to the context. We don't see anywhere else in the New Testament where Paul or any other writer talks about this. So if we don't see that taught anywhere else, then we can't make a rule for the whole church for all the centuries that have followed based on this one passage. Right? So just like we are saying women don't have to cover their heads, we uh, also don't say that men uh, men should, I mean, women yeah, don't have to cover their heads. We won't say that now, OK, we are going to make a rule that all men should never cover their heads when they're praying. We don't make 
those kinds of rules because we understand that from scripture, scripture was written in that context to that culture. We don't see this repeated anywhere else in scripture. So it was for that culture that they were being taught that. Okay, so um, understanding the cultural background. So that is the end of our chapter on culture. Uh, now we're going to look at interpreting the grammar of scripture. So because scripture uses language to communicate its truth, we want to pay attention to the language that it's using, right? The words that are being used, uh, the way the words are used. Uh, we want to study. So how many of you enjoy literature? Did you study any? La it doesn't have to be English literature, but we whatever languages we studied, we always have stories. We are understanding how uh, how things are written, right? We study uh, poetry. We study prose. Do, do any of you all enjoy that? Yes. <laughs> A little bit. Okay. Good. So this is that kind of study of scripture where we are studying the words. We are studying how sentences are formed. We are studying what kinds of words they've used. Why have they used these words? So um, this is how uh, um, thoughts are put out, right? To put out a thought, you use words. And those words put together form a sentence. So we are going back to the words themselves to understand what was the thought behind it. Why uh, why were these words used? And also because we're studying it in another language. So that also adds to the reason for us to study it further, understanding what was the meaning of the word in the original language. What was that meaning of the word in that culture? How was the word used outside of scripture? How was the word used in scripture? How is the word used in this passage, in this book, by this writer? All of those things we'll study. Then the form of words, so understanding what is the tense. Is it a past tense? Is it a present tense, a future tense? Is it a continuous tense, something that we have to continue doing? Uh, when it says, abide in me, is that something that was we had to abide at some point? Is it something we had to continue doing uh, as believers? Uh, when it says, by his stripes, we were healed. Is that uh, something we will be healed in the future? We are healed in the present? Uh, or he, our healing is already complete on the cross? So understanding that it was written in that in a state of completion, that our healing is complete. So we look at the tense of the verb to understand what does this mean for us today. OK? Uh, the function of words, whether it is an action verb, whether it is uh, something that is just describing something. Um, now, this is a deeper study of the text itself. But these are the things that we look at when we're doing a literary study. And then the relationship of words. So we can see uh, sometimes something is a result of something else. So we see a Bible verse that starts with, therefore, do this. Or therefore, we follow this, right? So we are seeing therefore. That means we need to read the passage before that to understand what is the reason we are doing what we are doing. OK, therefore, let us love one another. Why should we love one another? What does the previous verse say? So that therefore is a very important word. Uh, it helps us understand that our loving each other is based on whatever was said before that. Uh, so. These are the different things that we need to look at. We need to pay attention to words used in scripture uh, and uh, understand that all of those words actually are important words uh, that will help us further understand the truth or the thought that was behind what is communicated. Uh, the meaning of words. OK, so um, we, if we look at in. Uh, because we're looking at English translations, sometimes the English translation may not fully carry the meaning of the original language. Okay, so uh, the example that is given here is the word dunamis and exousia. Now, uh, dunamis talks about the ability. So when someone is able to do something, 
you use the word dunamis, uh, but someone who has authority from somebody else to do something, you use the word exousia. So uh, let's just look at Luke 10, 19. If someone can read that for us. Luke 10, 19. Uh, behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall uh, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Thank you. So um, here we see, you can see the word authority and you can see the word power, right? Uh, but in some translations, they will use the same word. They'll use power. Power. I've given you power to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Uh, so uh, if a translation is doing that, then you miss out on the difference in the nuance of the two words. Right? Uh, one is where we have received authority through Christ to do this to have power over Satan. And uh, the second one is power of the enemy is the abilities of the enemy, whatever the enemy is able to do, we have authority over him to uh, to trample or to destroy the works that he is doing. Um, let's also look at Acts 1.8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Thank you. So here uh, we see the word power, and that is the word dunamis. So this is you receive abilities by the Holy Spirit. You receive the ability to be a witness because of the Holy Spirit. So uh, to understand the difference there, sometimes exousia be uh, translated as power, but it means power that comes from authority that is given from someone who is more powerful than us. Right? So uh, we have that kind of authority through Christ. And we have these abilities, these powers through the Holy Spirit. The dunamis in Acts 1 8 is through the Holy Spirit. So uh, this is where we look at the meaning of the word because if we're looking just at the English, we'll just see power for dunamis, power for exousia, and we don't understand uh, what kind of power it's talking about. Uh, but Nowadays, a lot of translations will make that distinction, um, but sometimes they will not because English may not have a word that will fully translate the Greek word and give us that meaning. So it's important to look at the meanings of words, also to look at different translations. That's also helpful. Uh, another way is to look at a compound word. So sometimes a word may have two parts to it. So if we look at the two parts, they may help us understand what does that word mean uh, more fully. Uh, sometimes there is a word that's used that has some kind of historical context. So the example here is born servant, right? Now we don't know what born servant is in our day, and we don't know what what does that word mean? So sometimes uh, if you read in scripture, it'll just be uh, a servant, a slave. It will be translated like that. Some will say a born servant. Uh, but to understand in that culture, a born servant was someone who willingly sold themselves to be a slave to somebody else. They were giving up their rights to uh, fully serve somebody else under their authority. So they were like a slave, but different from the slavery that we understand in present day. And especially in the New Testament, this is actually used as uh, something that was honored, like it was an honorable position to be a bond servant of Christ. Um, also in that culture, if you were a slave to someone who was high ranking, like someone of high status, those slaves had greater authority, uh, greater status in society than the people who were free. So that's how a born servant of Christ, uh, that's how they were viewing it, like we serve the king, right? So we are fully submitted. We have given ourselves as slaves to Christ, OK? 
but in that, our status is raised to a place where uh, we are uh, higher than people who consider themselves free, right? People who are uh, free from the authority of Christ. Uh, we have greater uh, status in God's eyes. Self. Like how God says, uh, even the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. So to be in the kingdom of God is uh, a place of greatness that uh, is much greater than someone who is outside of the kingdom of God. Um, so understanding all of that, understanding the meaning in the culture, understanding the history behind the word. Uh, so what uh, what are some things that we can consider as we are interpreting the meaning of words? Uh, one is that it shouldn't uh, shouldn't be explained based on the English etymology. So, uh, if we take that same word dunamis, right? Uh, because Greek uses very similar alphabets to English, uh, dynamite is very close to dunamis, it uses the same alphabets. So we can't take that English transliteration of dunamis and say it means dynamite or it means dynamo. OK, so that is not a correct interpretation of the word. We will look at the English meaning, and then we'll uh, understand what does it mean. But we don't take the uh, transliteration or the English uh, version of that word and then explain the word based on that, on the English transliteration. Um, so what was the customary meaning of the word? So this is what we I was talking about. So how was the word being used in the culture around them? Uh, how is the word being used in the specific passage that we're reading? How does the writer use the same word in the same book? So we see John uh, in his gospel he uses the word abide a lot. Even in 1 John, the word abide is used a lot. So that means that is a word that is central to his writing. He thinks that that is something that is very important for believers. So we look at how has he used this word throughout his throughout this book. If I'm uh, studying 1 John. How has he used abide throughout this book? Uh, what does it mean to abide? What all does he say about abiding in God or abiding in God's word? How do we abide in God's word? Uh, we look at how he's used it in his book. Then we look at how is it used in other books? Is the same writer using that same word in another book? Um, are other writers using that word in other books in the New Testament? So all of those things will contribute to our understanding of what does the word abide mean. So we talked about this in uh, Bible study when we're doing a word study or a topical study. This is how we do it. We take uh, that word, we look at how it's being used in different contexts, but we start with how is it used in this passage? How is it used in that book? How is it used in other books by the same writer? Because they'll usually use it the same way in their other books. Then how is it used by other writers and in other parts of scripture? OK? But we also have to keep in mind when it's used in other parts of scripture, it may be used in a different way. So we don't have to take and try and make it fit into what we are studying. If, if the other writer has used it in a different way, we don't include that in our conclusion about, OK, what does it mean to abide? But we still understand, OK, this writer has said abide uh, in this way, but John talks about it in this other way. And so when we are, if we're writing a teaching on it or if we our own personal study on it, then we understand abide based on all the things that actually uh, can be clubbed together. We don't have to try and make everything work together uh, if it's used in a different way. OK, so then uh, Paul, likewise, he uses uh, the word fullness in different books. So this is an example. So the first one was where abide is used by John. In the same book, he keeps using the word abide. Uh, Paul, on the other hand, uses the word fullness, and he uses it across. So he, he uses it in Ephesians, he uses it in Colossians. So how has he used it in all of these books? And how do we understand the word based on how he's used it in these different books? And then um, 
another example is the word pray in the spirit which paul also uses but is also used in the book of jude so it's used by a different writer okay so what does it mean to pray with the spirit or to pray in the spirit right uh, so uh, let's just turn to first corinthians 14 14 and 15 if someone can read that for us For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Thank you. So um, here we see that Paul himself is explaining what it means to pray in the spirit, right? I pray in a tongue. My spirit prays, my mind is unfruitful. So I'm not praying with my mind. I'm praying. Uh, so my mind is not fully active in this prayer. It's more something of the spirit. And I'm praying in a tongue. He's clearly saying that. So based on this, we can understand when he's talking about praying in the spirit that he's talking about praying in tongues. We can look at this in other places, in Jude, where he talks about it. Uh, how is Jude talking about it? Is he talking about praying in the spirit in some other way other than praying in tongues? Um, so uh, why we do this is because um, there are people who don't believe in praying in tongues. And uh, the way praying with the spirit is interpreted is based on their beliefs, right? Um, but we have to go back to scripture and we have to say, OK, what does scripture say about this? Is scripture saying that praying in the spirit means praying in tongues, uh, which we see here in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, and so that's how we conclude that this is something that Paul was doing and Paul was teaching the church to do. OK, uh, so this is why we want to pay attention to how is it being used, what is the context, and we want to understand it, understand what is the meaning of it, so that we are doing it correctly. Um, we're not interpreting. So we don't say praying in the spirit is praying, um, uh, praying, just being led by the spirit. We can still use our own words, but we're just being led by the spirit. Or we're praying with great uh, emotion. Uh, we don't say that based on this passage, on these passages that we've read. Okay, so that is what a right interpretation of a passage is. We understand it based on its context. Uh, so these are some other examples uh, of different words. So Gehenna is actually a Hebrew word. In Greek, it's uh, transliterated to Gehenna, and it means the Valley of Hinnom. So uh, this word was used uh, basically to refer to a valley that was outside Jerusalem, uh, but also to uh, talk about a place of eternal punishment. Uh, so a place of uh, where there was an eternal fire. Uh, so it talks about a place of punishment for those who are ungodly, uh, the place of punishment for evil. So looking at, OK, it means the value of Hinnom, but what does the value of Hinnom uh, depict? Right? We have to look at the meaning of the word. Um, in uh, the word uh, for death, Sheol or Hades, right? Sheol is the Hebrew word. Hades is the Greek word. So. Uh, understanding how was this used in that culture. Uh, we have Ruach and Numa, right? In the in Hebrew, it's Ruach. In Greek, it's Numa. And this can be translated as spirit, breath, or wind. OK, so uh, we have to look at the context. Is it talking about spirit? If it's talking about the spirit, is it talking about the Holy Spirit, the spirit of a person, or an evil spirit? If it's talking, if it's not talking about the spirit, is it talking about breath or air, or is it talking about the wind? Uh, so understanding that the same word was used for so many different meanings, and only the context can help us understand which way it's being used. Okay, so we can't just translate it any way we want. We can't just decide for ourselves. Okay, this means the Holy Spirit, or this means breath, or this means wind. We have to see what is the passage. Like the uh, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Right? We only have the word numa there, but uh, why are we saying that it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? 
it could be the fruit of a person's spirit right so we look at the context we understand what is that passage talking about can we rightly say that this is the fruit of the holy spirit or can we say that this is the fruit of the human spirit uh, based on what we're reading in the context uh, and then greek uh, the word love right uh, there are many words for the word love in greek uh, but in english we only have one word and so going back to the Greek helps us understand what word was used in the Greek and how can we interpret it in uh, the passage that we are reading. Is it talking about the God kind of love, the agape love, or is it talking about brotherly and sisterly love in the church? Uh, which Greek word uh, have they chosen to use? Is it talking about uh, physical or sexual love, or is it talking about a familial love that is a love uh, between family members? Uh, which word have they used in the passage and how can we understand it for us today? Okay, so um, that is a bit on the study of words. We also have figures of speech. So uh, in English, we may say it's raining cats and dogs, right? What does that mean? Does it mean that literally there are cats and dogs falling from the sky? No, it's raining heavily, right? It's raining, uh, it's raining very heavily. So rather than just saying it's raining very heavily, it's raining cats and dogs. So uh, likewise, in the scriptures, we'll see uh, figures of speech like that that are used uh, that we can't take literally. Okay, if we are taking it literally, we are misunderstanding what the writer was trying to say. Uh, so how do we know if something is a figurative uh, or a literal uh, sentence? Uh, we have certain rules that we can apply. One is we'll always take the literal sense unless there's some good reason to say that we shouldn't use the literal translation. OK, so like if we're looking at it's raining cats and dogs, it doesn't make sense to rain cats and dogs. No one has ever seen cats and dogs falling from the sky. So you can say without a doubt, OK, this can't be taken literally. We have to understand what is the meaning of this sentence. If somebody from some other culture is reading in English and reading this sentence, it's raining cats and dogs, for them, how would they interpret it? Right? Uh, they would have to understand what does this, what does this saying mean? to these people? How do people use this kind of saying? And what does it mean? Uh, in the same way, that's what we'll do with scripture as well. Uh, so if the literal meaning involves an impossibility, uh, so in John 1.29, uh, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. So we know clearly that that does not mean that Jesus is a sheep or a lamb, right? You know that it is a figure of speech. What was the lamb used for in that time? It was used for sacrifice. Jesus uh, is the sacrifice. Now, we already have all of that knowledge. So when we read the scriptures, we automatically do that interpretation in our minds, right? Uh, so there are some things where we know when we read it immediately, OK, this is a figure of speech. This is something that means something else. They've just used a picture to depict it, uh, right? Jeremiah 1.18, uh, uh, if someone can read that for us. Jeremiah 1.18, uh, for behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against its priests, and against the people of the land. Thank you. So uh, here we can see that Jeremiah is made a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall. Now, we know that he's not physically become that, right? But those words mean something. So what do those words mean? To be a fortified city, to be protected against one's enemies, to be an iron pillar, to be strong, 
right? Uh, someone who cannot be moved, uh, to be a bronze wall, to be uh, to have strong defenses. So to understand what did this mean to Jeremiah, to hear those words, what did they see fortified cities, iron pillars, bronze walls around them? How were those things used in that culture? And what when God is saying that to Jeremiah, what can we understand about what God had said to Jeremiah? That he would he was strong, he was protected, uh, but understanding where he was seeing these iron pillars, bronze walls in that culture will help us further understand uh, the significance of it to Jeremiah to hear those words from God. Uh, we'll also take it to be a figure of speech if uh, the taking the literal meaning is an absurdity. So the first one was if it's an impossibility. The second is if it's an absurdity. So Isaiah fifty five twelve, the trees of the field of the fields will clap their hands. We know, okay, that's not something that uh, we're going to ever see, right? Uh, at least. I don't know, maybe in heaven, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we can understand that to be rejoicing, uh, right? All of nature is rejoicing in what uh, God is doing. Um, but we don't take that literally. Um, we also won't take it literally if uh, the result of it is something that is immoral, something that is against God's character. Uh, so John 6, 53 to 58, Jesus says, uh, no one can uh, be part of me if they do not eat my blood, uh, if they do not eat my body or drink my blood. And people couldn't understand that. So many of his, uh, it's recorded there in John 6, that so many people left him because they found this saying to be too hard. Right? Uh, so, um, we understand that God was not demanding that we physically do that, right? That uh, we're physically consuming the body of Christ. Uh, but uh, why do we understand that? Because that is against God's character. The eating uh, human meat is not going to be part of God's character, is not part of God's character. So we can uh, easily understand that that was a figure of speech. Uh, but but uh, in the early church, uh, because people outside the church knew that the church practiced this, they believed that the church was actually practicing cannibalism, was uh, physically eating uh, human meat. So it is possible that people take these things literally, right? So th that's why it's important for us to be able to make those differentiations. And then um, sometimes in scripture itself, there'll be a picture of fig, uh, something that is said figuratively, and there will be an explanation of what it means. So here the example is First Thessalonians 4. Uh, those who fall asleep are those who have died. So the picture is of someone falling asleep. But what has happened literally is that they have died. OK? So uh, what are the times we? Uh, take something to be a figure of speech and not we don't take it literally well, communion Holy yeah communion. yeah in communion as well we practice that uh, today right so we say this is the body of Christ which is broken for you but we don't believe that that is the physical body uh, that we're actually eating right or the physical flesh that we are actually eating. Uh, so these are some of the principles. If something is an impossibility, if something is in a, an absurdity, if it would demand immoral action, or if in scripture itself there is a literary explanation given to it. Uh, these are the times we'll take it to be a figure of speech. But if it doesn't, if it's not impossible, if it's not absurd, if it doesn't demand a moral action, if there's no explanation given, then we will take it as a, as the text itself says, we'll take it to be literal. Okay, so our general practice is to take it to be literal. So how should we interpret figures of speech? First is, is there a figure of speech involved? We have to determine if there is a figure, figure of speech involved. Uh, let's just read 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 6.
second timothy 2 verses 3 to 6 you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of jesus christ no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier and also if anyone competes in athletics he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules the hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops thank you so we can see here three words that are used uh, for people who are following christ right uh, the soldier the athlete the farmer so each of those things are used to depict certain aspects of our uh, our discipleship like as we are following christ how do we follow him uh, so we have to see is there a figure of speech involved if there's a figure of speech involved how can we understand it based on the passage itself but then how can we understand it based on what that culture was seeing uh, what they were experiencing what did soldiers do in that culture uh, what was uh, what was their understanding of athletics very different from what we see right uh, so how do they how did they understand it how did they see it uh, farmers how did they view farmers? Uh, what were what was the status of farmers in the society? All of these things will help us understand what it means for us to be disciples, to follow Christ. Um, Matthew 7, 6, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs, right? So uh, Jesus is not literally calling that lady or dog or a uh, He's not literally calling those people dogs and pigs, right? He's just saying, uh, don't give something that is holy to something that is unholy, because they will. It will be. Um, it will be treated as not sacred. So entrust holy things to people who will show reverence, who will recognize uh, that it is to be treated with reverence. Um, discover the image and the non-image. So uh, within the passage itself, there will be something that is an image and there will be something that is not an image. So Isaiah 8, 7, mighty flood waters of a uh, mighty flood of waters uh, refers to the king of Assyria. So if you read that verse, you can see that he talks about the mighty flood of waters and then talks about the king of Assyria coming to capture the people. So you can understand that that image is used to describe how that king is going to come and take over the land uh, and going to conquer the land. Uh, John 2, 19, when Jesus talks about destroying the temple, so the people understood it literally, right? They said, how can you destroy it and rebuild in three days? We've taken so many years to build it. Uh, but they only realized post-resurrection that Jesus, the disciples were the only ones who realized that Jesus was talking about his body. So um, to be able to, if people at that time itself who were hearing Jesus speaking, couldn't understand that Jesus was talking about something else. He was just using that picture of the temple. Uh, that means much more today we have to put in a little more work to understand. Uh, thankfully, scripture also helps us, right? It already gives us these explanations, already shows us what was the final meaning. Uh, so that makes it a lot easier for us. Um, this is the point of comparison. So uh, we understand why is this picture being used, right? Psalm 1, 3, he will be like a tree planted by rivers of water. What does that mean? That bears forth its fruit in season, whatever he does prospers. It already gives us the explanation. Uh, so we understand that that picture means something. So we don't just take our own meaning for what a tree is. A tree grows tall, a tree is strong. We don't just uh, come up with our own meanings for the uh, point of why he said he'll be like a tree. We use the scriptures itself to help us interpret what does that mean. Um, do not assume that a figure always means the same thing. So we can see Revelation 5.5 5 refers to Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. 1 Peter 5.8 refers to Satan as a roaring lion. So just because we see the word lion, we don't understand that 
to always refer to Jesus or always refer to Satan. So if, even if the same word is used, it may be used to refer to different things in different places. So we have to understand the immediate context of what is being said about that. Uh, place legitimate limits or controls on the figures by means of logic and communication. So uh, when Jesus says, I will come like a thief, right? he's talking about coming suddenly, not coming to steal. Right? Or uh, Job 9, 6, the pillars of the earth. Uh, so some people have taken that literally uh, in the past. right? And so there were big debates between science and the Bible. Uh, why are we saying that the earth is on pillars and all of that? But to understand there that Job is using poetic language. And he's talking about the pillars. He's, he's talking about the foundations of the earth being shaken. Uh, so these are places where it's important for us to be able to differentiate. Just in line with that, uh, when Jesus says uh, it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of the needle as compared to a rich man going to heaven. So that he's literally meaning uh, the essence. No, it is not like a figure of speech there. How hard hearted for a rich man to enter the kingdom for that he uses this illustration. Yes, yeah, literally, yeah, literally, it's hard for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So, also, it's hard for a rich man, yes. Uh, but if we go on in that passage, uh, the conclusion is who then can be saved? And then he says, no one can be saved except by the grace of God, right? So the conclusion is that all of us, is, it's hard for everyone to be saved. We are all saved only by divine intervention. Uh, but yes, we can take that as literal in the terms of like as hard as it would be for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle. Uh, yeah. Yeah. OK. So um, we have just a few minutes. Do you all have a little more uh, ability to continue? Are you all OK? Five more minutes. Yeah. OK, so this is a little, um, thank you. Thanks. I can see the online as well. Thank you. So um, this is a little heavier, this uh, topic of types and shadows. And we will continue it next week as well. Um, yeah, so um, basically, in scripture, we see the use of types and shadows. Uh, we'll also talk about other ways in which uh, scripture uses things to point to other things. Uh, but types are used in the Old Testament. okay? And they are something that points to something else that is to come in the future. okay? So there are certain characteristics first we look at of what a type is. So there will be some resemblance between what is mentioned in the Old Testament and what comes later. Uh, and usually, it is something that's pointing to Christ. Okay, So something that uh, was used in the Old Testament to point to the coming Messiah that is fulfilled in Christ. Um, usually, it's, it could be something else also. may not be Christ, only pointing to Christ. Uh, the other thing is, it's always a historical reality. So that means it's something that happened, or it's some person who really lived, or it's some event that actually took place. Okay, So it's not something that is imagined, not just a story or an illustration that was made in the Old Testament that is later shown uh, to be fulfilled in the New Testament. It is something historical that happened uh, that is fulfilled in uh, later on in Scripture, in the New Testament. Uh, it is a prefiguring, so it, like I said, so it's predictive. It points ahead. It's prophetic in nature. Uh, it's anticipating something that is to come. Um, and usually, between what happened in the type and what happens in its fulfillment, which is the anti-type, uh, there is a heightening. That is, the anti-type is greater and superior to what the type was. So because we're saying a lot of the things point to Christ, Christ will always be greater so uh, than the type that was mentioned in the Old Testament. 
Okay, so as we go through this, it will become clearer. We look at examples, and uh, that should help us understand it better. Uh, some God himself has planned. Uh, he planned that in the Old Testament this would be there so that people would be prepared for it would point to the Messiah. So that's why we see in the New Testament this is a fulfillment of this. This is a fulfillment of this. Because God himself had planned and put that in the Old Testament to prepare people's hearts to say that there is someone who is coming. Uh, there is something greater that is coming. Uh, and it's designated by God. That means that scripture itself will usually say this was a type of this. Uh, so it will make it clear that we should understand it as a type. Um, so some examples of types, we see Melchizedek uh, in the Old Testament and the antitype is Christ's perpetual priesthood. Uh, so let's just read this, Hebrews 7.3 and 15 to 17. Hebrews 7, 3. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God and remains a priest continually. Thank you. And verses 15 to 17 of the same chapter. And it is yet far more evident if the in the if in the likeness of Melchi, Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment but according to the power of an endless life for he testifies you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek thank you so we can see in scripture itself Christ being uh, being uh, talked about as someone who is like Melchizedek, right? So uh, we see it was designated by God, that is, Scripture talks about it. It was by divine design, that is, uh, Melchizedek was used intentionally by God to point to someone who would come later, uh, who would be not... Uh, so Melchizedek was not part of the priestly line of Aaron, right? So his designation came from God as a priest. Likewise, Christ himself was uh, placed as a priest, chosen by God to be a high priest for us. Um, so by divine design, uh, we go back to the other characteristics. Uh, it is a heightening, that is, Christ is greater than Melchizedek. Um, Melchizedek pointed ahead in a prophetic way to someone who would come. Uh, and uh, Jesus Christ is that fulfillment of what he, uh, what Melchizedek pointed to. Uh, Melchizedek was an actual person who lived. Jesus was an actual person who lived. And there is resemblance. So in Hebrews 7 itself, we see all of the resemblances that are mentioned. Uh, no family, no genealogy, all of these things. Um, and so this is how we understand the type. We'll continue this uh, next week. Uh, I just wanted to also mention about, uh, I think, the exam uh, for those of you who haven't completed it. I'll just give us, uh, were there, was there anyone here who didn't complete the exam, uh, which I posted last week or two weeks ago? Because I saw that online there were people who had not yet submitted their exam. OK. I don't see any hands or any messages. Yes. Sister, yes. I posted my uh, uh, exam, but now I don't see it anymore. OK. I did release this course. Uh, just let me know if you are able to go in and see it uh, I, now. I saw the score, and after that, I'm not able to see it. So I don't know whether you received it. OK, OK. It, no, the, if you received the score, is because I received it, because I had okay. to release the scores, yeah. Um, but I still see that some people have not yet submitted. I just didn't know if the if y'all will be submitting it. Submitted, but I think it was one day later. 
yes so uh so for all of you if there is anyone else who's still uh, needing to submit it uh, i'll give an extension just for this time uh, because it's our first exam um so just let me know you can uh, just message me uh, because i can still see some pending uh, and then i'll give an extension up to wednesday if you still need time uh, but it'll be just for this time okay um thank you all we'll come back for the next hour in after the break okay. thank you <laughs>